restore your memory, jog your memory as to where we were. We are in the midst of the plague. So previously in Exodus, we are seeing the smackdown battle between the God of Israel, the God who made the heavens and the earth, Jehovah, the covenant God of Israel, and the 80, some 80 gods of Egypt. And seven plagues in, I have to tell you, it's not looking so good for the Egyptian gods. Right now, it's 7-0 in favor of Jehovah. The order of the plagues, you'll remember, um, they're, they're uh, uh, divided into three sets of three plagues with a grand finale plague at the end, uh, just like we allow our uh, biggest fireworks to go to the end, so too the biggest impact plague was saved for the end. But the three sets of three, nonetheless, uh, have a structure, and the plagues, the first two plagues of each set of three are introduced with a warning. Uh, the, uh, the first of those two plagues in each set is specifically a warning in the morning, so the first two with a warning, and the first one of those two, warning in the morning, and then the third plagues, in other words, plague three, plague six, plague nine, these arrive without warning. The divine purpose of the plague, one, to compel Pharaoh to release the Hebrews. That's certainly something that we all uh, can get from watching even a movie or even a cartoon uh, on, uh, on the subject. But secondly, divine purpose was for the Egyptians to receive justice. The plagues did indeed deliver justice, and not just any kind of justice, retributive justice, the kind of justice that is promised to the nations who mistreat God's chosen people, Israel, based upon the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12, 3, first clause, I will bless those who bless you, and the ones who curse you, I will curse. That is what the Egyptians are receiving in spades, justice. Number three reason, divine purpose for the plague, to demonstrate God's power and authority. Well, certainly at this point, it's accomplishing its goals. And fourth and final purpose of the plague, to demonstrate the Lord's superiority over Egyptians, uh, the Egyptians' gods, Egypt's gods. We have indeed a divine smackdown, um, a smackdown of one people's faith system versus another. And to remind you of the important verse, the important passage that we encountered last time in our message, we saw plague number seven. And Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron after plague number seven and said, I have sinned this time. The other times he gets a pass, I guess. Uh, the Lord... That's the covenant name, Pharaoh himself. Even though Pharaoh himself is never given a specific name, he's not named within the text, we have here this unnamed Pharaoh speaking, articulating the name of Israel's God. Jehovah the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, the Tetragrammaton, the unpronounceable name of God. Adonai, the Lord. Jehovah, he is the righteous one. And in contrast, I and my people are the wicked ones. So that is a tremendous admission of moral failure, not only for him personally, but as the leader of his people, he makes this uh, confession before Moses, a former slave, Yes, also former prince as well, but nonetheless a former slave. And he says, I and my people are the wicked ones. Probably a lot more them than me, but nonetheless, uh, uh, that's what he says. And he asks Moses, his and the representative of this other God, who is, uh, who is uh, really running roughshod over the uh, Egyptian gods, uh, and he's asking this representative of this foreign god who is acknowledged, and he's going to acknowledge him again in verse 28, make supplication to the Lord. In other words, pray on our behalf. 
for there has been enough of God's thunder and hail. So pray to this God that I have henceforth admitted not to knowing and refused to acknowledge. I now acknowledge the existence of this God by name and ask you to make supplication on my behalf and on behalf of that of my people. And if you do so, I will let you go. And you shall stay no longer. Just in case if you miss what I will let you go means. Right? Um, and now we begin the narrative. At this point, Moses, of course, uh, prayed for, for Pharaoh and asked exactly when you wanted the plague to stop. Pharaoh said, here's what is going to stop. Uh, Moses did exactly what Pharaoh asked. God did exactly what Moses asked. And then Pharaoh reneged on his promise. His heart was hardened. He refused to let the people go. That's where we left you. Seven plagues, seven no's from Pharaoh, seven victories from the Lord, the God of Israel. And now we get to the narrative of plague eight, beginning a new chapter, chapter 10, which unfolds as follows. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may perform these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandson how I made a mockery of the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them, that you may know that I am the Lord, the covenant God of Israel. So the second plague in this third set of plagues, according to the pattern, accompanied by a warning. Moses instructed by God, speak to Pharaoh, even though the king's heart had been divinely hardened, as had been, according to God, as had been the heart of Pharaoh's servants. And we see a previously undisclosed insight behind the hardening of Pharaoh's heart. The king's obstinate refusal to free the Hebrews provides an opportunity for the Lord for him to show his signs before him, before the Jewish people. And the memory of the Lord's powerful intervention on behalf of the Hebrews, his people, this story was to be orally passed down to each succeeding generation of Hebrews. Pass it down, tell the story, take this memory, share it with your children and with your grandchildren from generation to generation. It is the legacy of the Hebrews. It is the legacy of the Jewish people to know that God intervened in the course of human history on behalf of his chosen people. And that would guarantee if you do this, then you will know that I am the covenant God. I am Adonai. I am Jehovah. I am the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. God's mighty signs are to serve as foundation pegs. For what? To do what? To confirm the Jewish people's collective faith and strengthen their trust in the Lord. This is a lesson that speaks to us through history. 3,500 years of history. This instruction penetrates even to us today, instructing us in how to behave. 
instructing us in the responsibilities that we have to convey the message of God's faithfulness to the next generation. And lest you think your responsibility is complete by passing it to just one generation, God says, no, the next generation as well. Make sure you hit two. If each generation hit two generations coming afterwards, then the heritage would be preserved. Are you sharing with the next generation within your own family, within your own neighborhood, within your own community, within your own sphere of influence? Are you sharing with the next generation what God has done? A, in history, recorded in the Bible, you can pass down, It's a legacy for all of us, not just for Jewish people, but anybody who follows the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through Yeshua, through the Messiah, through his son. But that's one part of a legacy that you can pass down, but what about your story? Your personal story? How has God worked in your life? How has God intervened? See, it's easy to talk about big, giant themes like this, themes that are movie-worthy, how God intervened in the course of human history on behalf of a people group. Awesome. Wow. But what about how God intervened in the course of human history for you? Has God intervened for you ever? Have you ever seen God's work, God's hand at work in your life? Don't keep that to yourself. Pass that around. Share it. Share it. Pass it down the line vertically. But you know what else? I, I could use some encouragement. Pass it around horizontally. I'd like to hear about it as well. Right? We need to hear each other's stories. In the old days of uh, the Messianic movement, before there was such a thing as Messianic congregations, we had missions. And one of the things that we would do... Um, on a semi-regular basis, not every week, but maybe uh, uh, once a month, we would have uh, the opportunity to share testimonies. Test- give testimony. Who wants to stand up and share what God has done in your life this week or this past month? And people, normal people, average Joes, of course, they were all Jewish believers, room full of Jewish believers at the time in Brooklyn, Coney Island. Um, Average women, men, would stand up. Let's face it, most of them weren't speakers. But nonetheless, they could speak. And they could share from their heart what God had done. I have very vivid recollections of my mother uh, standing up, um, and, and giving testimonies, uh, whenever the opportunity uh, to give testimony. And I also remember that as a child, I used to make uh, fun of my mom because she couldn't get through um, a testimony at any time, anywhere, without crying. And I remember laughing as a kid and teasing my mom, you know, okay, well, you're going to cry again, mom. Yeah. And I thought it was really funny when I was a kid, but now those tears are beautiful to me in, in, in uh, reminiscence. But sharing, sharing your testimony, sharing your stories with one another, well, that, why wouldn't it bring someone to tears? You know, isn't it an awesome, wonderful wondrous thing when God actually acts on your behalf. I love when somebody does me a favor. Um, I love when somebody does something uh, good for me and nice to me. It's always, a, it's always a plus, and I encourage you all to do as many nice things to me as you uh, like to do. Um, but when God does you a solid That is really memorable. And that 
is worthy of being passed down. And there's no greater solid that God has done for his people than um, uh, freeing them, liberating them from the enslavement, of course, first of the Hebrews enslaved to Pharaoh, um, and then, of course, the rest of us today who were enslaved to sin at one time, but now are free at last. Well, let's get back to the to the text here, otherwise I won't get through. Uh, and uh, this, this series might go on indefinitely. Uh, <laughs> it'll, take, uh, it'll take us longer to get through than it took the Jewish people to pass through the wilderness. Uh, that wouldn't do very... Anyway, but that you may know that I am the Lord. So passing on the story helps strengthen our collective faith. You know, there's another thing. Like, we sing, sometimes we sing... Um, in our worship songs, we sing about the great acts of God. Um, there is a trend today, and has been going on for several decades now, this movement of, I want to express my feelings to God. Let me tell God how I feel. And you make me feel so whatever right? And you are so wondrous, and I love you so much, and I, 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 I sung so many of our songs today in the worship world, not here at Bethel Shalom, but as a, as a general trend, um, are all about I and how I feel and how, wh- I like the stories that are included in the songs, right, where we sing collectively about God has done to us or to us historically, to us as believers, where we are the latest generation who participate in a common faith story. We're not just a collection of individuals whom God has saved and whom God loves. We are a community. We are a collection. And we're not the only generation who's ever lived and trusted in the Messiah. We stand in a long line, on the long line of shoulders of the generations of believers, Jewish and non-Jewish, who have come before us. So it's marvelous to share those things and to proclaim together as a, as a unified group within song, either verbal testimony or singing testimony, of the great things that God has done. I love those. All right, well, let's go on. Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh. And they said to him, so once again they approach Pharaoh, and they say to him, this is, thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, in case between one plague and this new one you've forgotten who you've acknowledged, uh, the Lord, Jehovah, the God of the Hebrews. This is what he says, and I quote, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Well, I just did humble myself before. No, no, you took it back. Uh, A humbling was a take back. That's not a real humbling. It doesn't count. It's got to stick. (laughs) We're like that too, right? You know, we, we, we apologize. We do something Terrible, we apologize to God. Uh, uh, I'll never do that again, I'm so sorry. I've really learned my lesson now, Lord, if you'll only only overlook this this one time, right? And then what happens? It happens again. Oops, okay, it's, it's not true repentance unless there's a resolution not to do such thing. Again, a true resolution, not a gameplay, right? And that's what Pharaoh's doing here. He's playing games. So Moses quotes God, and God is asking Pharaoh from one God to another. <laughs> How long will you refuse? Little man, little king, little God, small g, to humble yourself before me. Let my people go. That they may serve me. Again, watch that he's still not requesting from Pharaoh to free the slaves, period, end of story. There's still a purpose. It's a limited time purpose for the 
for the request, let my people go so that they may worship me. Because the endurance of Pharaoh's tenacity really strains all reason here. How long are you going to make your people endure this? How long can you yourself endure? You're, you are so st- you, You've proven you've got a strong backbone, Pharaoh. But enough is enough. It's like the mismatched wrestlers. They get down and the stronger guy has got the, 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 the lesser wrestler. He's got him down. It's very clear that the lesser wrestler is not going to come back. Well, there's not going to be a surprise victory. But nonetheless, he refuses to stamp the mat, to, to pound the mat, to slap the mat. He refuses to say uncle. This tenacity strains all reason. For if you refuse to let my people go, here's what I got in store for you. Here's the ultimatum that follows the request. If you refuse, here's what's coming. Behold, pay attention. Heads up, literally. Because tomorrow... I'm going to bring locusts into your territory. Now, locusts are a perpetual problem here in Texas. They, they show up, you know, some late summer, fall, right, sometime. I mean, when I first came to Texas back in the late 80s, I was astonished at, like, mounds of locusts, whatever these things are, that were, like, piled up at the entrance of grocery stores, you know, and you'd go into a... And they're just, they were just everywhere. They were in the parking lot. There were just he, heaps, heaps of, of locusts, right? Uh, you remember, see, cr- oh, like crickets, right, crickets, right? They're all over the place, right? And I don't like seeing one of them, okay? I don't like seeing it, and I don't mind admitting that I don't like even seeing one of them, let alone piles of them. Locusts has worse, a perpetual problem. Same family. Apparently they taste the same, but I wouldn't know. They're crunchy and good under chocolate. But uh, locusts are a perpetual problem in the ancient world. And actually, we still see locust swarms today. Um, you can go on, don't do it now, I'm preaching. But you can go on YouTube uh, and you can look at locust worms, and you can see actually modern news reports of locust worms coming. Egypt had one not long ago uh, that I remember seeing on YouTube. But it's a perpetual problem. And they were properly fe- uh, feared by the people. People were afraid of them. Why? Because they had the ability to devour the entire food supply of the entire region within mere moments or within hours. Or if they were just getting started, warmed up, maybe a few days. But all the food is gone. And an infestation was often viewed as a divine judgment. Now, you have Egyptian deities, you know, for each plague, there are one or more, often more, Egyptian deities that are uh, challenged by this plague. And you would have had uh, uh, Serapis or Serapia. His specialty was project was uh, protecting the Egyptian people from what locust infestations, um, and then of course Shu and Nut, the respective sky god and sky goddess, they fell down on the last uh, plague as well. The hail, and then Isis um, uh, and Set, Isis and Set uh, were the. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Isis and Set were the uh, gods and goddess charged with providing weather conditions that were conducive to agriculture. Uh, and uh, our friend, again, we've seen him before, Osiris, the Irish god, uh, the uh, god charged with crop production. And so they shall cover the surface of the land so that no one will be able to see the land. 
They will also eat the rest of what has escaped, what is left to you from the hail. What, is, what, what escaped damage from the hail is gone now. What is left to you from the hail, they will eat every tree which sprouts for you out of the field. This is not just going to be any old regular locust infestation. This is going to be the mother of all locust infestations and unprecedented in Egyptian history. Then your houses shall be filled, the houses of all your servants and the houses of all the Egyptians, something which neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen from the day that they came upon the earth until this day. And he, Moses, turned and went out from Pharaoh in a graphic breach of Egyptian court protocol without waiting for Pharaoh's royal dismissal. Moses dismissed himself. And Pharaoh didn't say a word. Pharaoh's servant said to him, how long will this man be a snare to us? Let the man go. Let the Hebrew slaves go that they may serve the Lord their God. It's just a worship service. It's a couple of weeks. Let them go. Do you not realize, O king, who should be aware of everything because he has, after all, a God, do you not realize that Egypt is destroyed? So Moses as Pharaoh, the same question, how long will you refuse? Pharaoh's servants echo that same question. How long? Moses is a snare to us. He is responsible for the distress of the nation. And so you have, in a sense, you have a, a, a Moses and the servants of Pharaoh ganging up on Pharaoh, all for the same reason. Let the Hebrews worship. So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to them, he's persuaded. <laughs> it worked. Go. Serve the Lord your God. But, uh, by the way, on the uh, words of uh, the immortal Columbo, uh, one more thing. <laughs> Who are the ones that are going? One more qualification. Because even though I'm giving in, I still want to let you know that I am I'm the king. Right? Uh, I'd like you to specify, Moses, how many of the Hebrews are uh, intended to include in this excursion. And Moses says, what we are going to do to worship the Lord requires the participation of every Hebrew, from the youngest to the oldest, but it also requires the entirety of our flocks and herds. We shall go with our young and with our old, with our sons and our daughters, with our flocks and our herds we shall go, for we must hold a feast to Jehovah, to the Lord. And then he said to them, Thus may the Lord be with you. If ever I let you and your little ones go, take heed, Pharaoh says, for evil is in your mind. Well, I'm not sure that that's really the way to go with that phrase. It's kind of a, a, a weird phrase in the Hebrew, um, especially when we know that the word for evil in Hebrew is ra, and Pharaoh uh, is, uh, 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 has a god, uh, Egyptian sun god, Ra, and Pharaoh was considered to be Ra's divine son. And so the intent of Pharaoh to say, instead of saying, you're plotting evil here, as this particular translation says, uh, it may be that, well, my god Ra is going before you. Your god Jehovah, definitely strong, no argument here, but don't forget that Ra my guy is just as strong. But uh, however we take this verse, Ra is going to wait to be challenged until the next plague. He's going to have his turn. The plague following locusts is unleashed. This is Ra right there. So uh, everybody say Ra. Ra. Woo, sis, boom, ba. Okay, next. Not so. Go now. 
Only the men among you. Serve the Lord. That's what you desire. Worship the Lord. And they were driven out of Pharaoh's presence. It's not a family outing. That's not what I'm authorizing. I'm only authorizing the men, the Hebrew women, the Hebrew children, forced to remain in Egypt. Why? Collateral. To ensure the Hebrew men return. And then, unlike Moses who had dismissed himself, right, Pharaoh's not going to allow that to happen again, so he contemptuously draws, drives them out uh, from his royal presence. And what the king failed to realize was that in attempting to force this compromise on Moses, the king had once again compromised his nation and he had compromised his people. The Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every plant of the land, even all that the hail had left. So Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt. The Lord directed an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. And the locusts came up over the land of Egypt and all the land of Egypt and settled in all the territory of Egypt. All is emphasized. I don't want to miss that. Um, they were very numerous. There had never been so many locusts, nor would there ever be Again, the unprecedented ferocity of this particular locust invasion is reiterated. We heard it before, we hear it again within a short amount of literary space. The reader is to understand this was the mother of all locust invasions. They covered the surface of the whole land. The land was darkened and they ate every plant of the land and all the fruit of the trees that the hail had left. Thus nothing green, nothing Green was left on tree or plant of the field through all the land of Egypt. This is an ecological disaster for the Egyptians. This is an agricultural disaster for the Egyptians. The locust infestation left no, uh, no fruit, no plant, no crop uneaten. And so what do you think is going to happen? Pharaoh hurriedly calls for Moses and Aaron, hurriedly. Now Pharaoh, is uh, his agenda has been knocked off skew, and, uh, knocked askew rather, and he now is on God's timetable. And he hurriedly calls for Moses and Aaron and says, I have sinned against, here's the name of God again that Pharaoh speaks, Jehovah your God, and against you personally. That's a twofer. Now, therefore, please forgive my sin only this once. Right? That's the familiar words from people even today still saying the same thing. I have sinned, God. Forgive me this once. I'll never do it again. Make supplication. Pray for me. Make supplication. Again, the name of God, the covenant name of God. The Lord your God, from a Pharaoh whose name is never mentioned in the text. That he would only remove this death from me. If, there, if this locust infestation continues, there would be famine in the land and there would be no food, not just for Pharaoh, but for his people. He went out from them from Pharaoh, Moses and made supplication to the Lord. So the Lord shifted the wind to a very strong west wind, which took up the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea, and not one locust was left in all the territory of Egypt. Moses prayed. God responded to his servant's petition for mercy. Because when we pray, God hears us. And he always responds, sometimes with a yes, like in this instance, sometimes with a definite no, which would have been a very different story if he had answered no. Uh, but, and sometimes in a wait a while, so that also would have been the equivalent of a no because there'd be nothing left at that point. Uh, and so the passage ends with verse 20. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart the Lord stiffened Pharaoh's backbone once again, and he did not let the sons of Israel go. 
Talk about a slow learner. My question for you this morning as I leave you is, how slow are you as a learner? What does God have to do to get your attention? What has God done to get your attention? How have you responded? Maybe there are some of us here right now we might not be experiencing a locust infestation per se, but the way it's hitting our lives, it might as well be. It's certainly having the impact. Maybe God is getting your attention right now. So my question to you is how are you going to respond? How have you responded? How are you responding? And if you're ignoring it, hoping that it goes away, that was a technique that was uh, uh, shown to be faulty by Pharaoh 3,500 years ago. So don't, don't kid yourself. If God is trying to get your attention, he's going to keep at it until you respond. You have the ability to say no. I wouldn't recommend it. If God is trying to get your attention right now, my sincere advice to you is say, here am I. You are God, I am not, and how may I serve you?